Hello and welcome to our first video of the year. Um, it's an introduction to environmental science and sustainability. For you used, I have posted on Schoology the questions for this lecture. Um, it's probably best if you handwrite these questions and let's get started. So we talked in class about our Earth being like an island and we talked about the characteristics of an island as well as the difficulties that we would have if we lived on an island. So just like an island, um, we rely on the earth for air, water, food, and shelter. Um, but unlike an island, we cannot outsource um, the things that we need in order to survive. Um, so we rely upon our environment and the environment is everything around us, both biotic and abiotic that we interact with every day. Biotic is the living things, abiotic is the non-living things. So it's amazing that we have this environment that has been sustained for 3.5 billion years. So it is something that is called a sustainable system. And when we're thinking about the idea of sustainability, it is the capacity of Earth's natural systems to survive, flourish, and adapt in the long-term future, okay? So we have three scientific principles of sustainability, and we learn these three scientific principles from nature. So the first thing is the dependence on solar energy. So the sun is going to provide warmth to the earth, and it is going to fuel photosynthesis for plants to grow and regenerate. The second is biodiversity. Earth has such an amazing variety of natural ecosystems and species. The third, is chemical cycling. So chemicals like nitrogen and water are cycled from the environment to ecosystems to organisms back to the environment. Those are the three scientific principles of sustainability. Um, some other key components to sustainability is the idea of natural capital. So in um, economics or government, we talk about capital as being money. So when we talk about natural capital, these are things or items from the environment that are going to support our economy. So for example, when we go into a forest and we cut down trees, we sell those trees to the timber market and that is part of natural capital. They help support our economy um, and build buildings and they are natural capital. Um, these natural capitals and natural services are key to sustainability because they help our um, renewal of air, water, and soil, and we can profit off of them in the future. We also have these things called ecosystem services. So in this picture over here, we have the blue being natural resources, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then the orange being ecosystem services. Ecosystem services, unlike natural capital, are things that the environment and nature does for free, like the purification of air and water. And we must have these ecosystem services in order to have healthy ecosystems. So we have the scientific principles of sustainability. We also have the social principles of sustainability. These are derived from economics, polit politics, and ethics. And when you combine all three of these things, it's something called the triple bottom line. Um, which shows the intersection of the factors of sustainability. So when all three of these things come together, it's something called the triple bottom line. So the first thing here is something called full cost pricing. So when you use full cost pricing, you're including the harmful and environmental cost of goods and services. So for example, when you go to the gas station, you pay a very small price. If we used full cost pricing, we could impose a green tax on the externalities of um, oil and gas. Um, an externality means the environmental cost of mining or drilling for the gas or the um, air pollution that is caused from burning the gas. The second thing is a win-win solution. So find a solution that benefits both people and the environment. And the third social principle of sustainability is a responsibility to future generations, which we've talked about a lot in class. So we're thinking about our actions to serve the generations to come. Um, and all of these approaches are going to take into account the triple bottom line in order to sustain our future. <clears throat> so we have two types of re resources on earth. The first is a renewable resource. Um, these are renewed within our lifetime. 
Um, the second is a non-renewable resource. So we only have a certain number of these on Earth. They are finite and they take longer than our lifetime to renew. Um, when we're thinking about renewable resources, we are going to consider the sustainable yield. So for example, California right now is in a drought, so they can only use a certain amount of groundwater before it's gone. So uh, we're using the highest rate uh, without reducing the available supply. Non-renewable resources, on the other hand, we will use them and use them and we're depleting the stock that we have of them. Um, when we use resources, the affluence of a country is going to um, impact the environment. So we have developed countries and less developed countries in the world. Developed countries are going to encompass 17% of the world's population. So for example, we have the United States, um, Europe and China being maybe more developed. And then our less developed countries are places like India, and um, when we're thinking about these countries, we're going to uh, quantitatively measure their impact by something called IPAT. So this equation right here means um, impact equals population size times affluence or the wealth of the country times the technology that they have available. <clears throat> that um, equation helps us develop the ecological footprint of a country or of a person. So when you see per capita ecological footprint, it means per person ecological footprint. And if we look back, we can see that these more developed countries or more developed areas are going to have a higher ecological footprint, both um, by country and per person or per capita. Um, most countries, actually most all countries, are in ecological deficit, so their footprint is larger than the biological capacity for replenishment. So for example, um, a USA citizen requires the use of five Earths, whereas someone in Brazil requires the Earth of 1.8 Earths. So that's someone from a higher, um, more developed area and a less developed area. Both of those are above their um, biological capacity for replenishment. And we are going to take away more and more of the Earth's capital as our population grows. Um, just as a reminder, our ecological footprint does include both our personal and societal choices. So you can choose what kind of food you eat. So if you become vegan, it will reduce your ecological footprints. However, our um, footprint will always stay a certain um, height or a certain amount because our society is continued, continuing to build roads, it's continuing to urbanize, um, which increases our ecological footprint as well. So in the end, all of this is thinking about our impact on earth and our degradation to earth. So when we talk about natural capital degradation, we're um, talking about our impact or how we are um, removing the naturalness of earth. Um, so we have two types of pollution. The first is point source pollution. So you can literally go out, point to a gutter, point to a um, output tank and say that is where this pollution is coming from so you can identify it. The second is non-point source pollution. So maybe an agricultural field, a city, um, a highway system. These pollution sources are very dispersed and they're difficult to identify where exactly um, the pollution is coming from. We have quantitatively measured our um, degradation on Earth by something called the Millennial Eco Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which was conducted by the United Nations. Um, and what that found out is that humans have degraded 60% of Earth's natural resources since 1950. Um, and what this really brings us to is the tragedy of the commons, um, which you read about in your article. Um, the tragedy of the commons is looking at these open access areas like the air or the water, and they are all common property to every human and every species on earth. So when we have open access or the open ability for anyone to come in and use these or anyone to, to come in and emit pollution to them, we see that um, these commons are degraded from overuse. Um, so some causes of environmental problems 
are really stemmed from population growth, which we'll talk more about in the future. Um, some other reasons that we have environmental problems are unsustainable resource use. So we're using too many resources and they're not, we're not using them sustainably. We're not thinking about that sustainable yield. Um, poverty is a huge issue. Um, so is affluence. So when we have affluence, we have a harmful environmental impact because we can have that high level of consumption. We have high levels of pollution um, and we have un unnecessary waste. Um, we can also outsource our items to those impoverished areas. So we don't actually ever really see the impact that we're having on the earth. And those places of poverty um, are just trying to make money um, because they are working to survive. So they want to be able to fulfill their basic needs like food, water, and shelter, but sometimes they're unable to. So that's what they're really thinking about. So we have to have this balance between the affluence and the poverty, which is a cause of an environmental issue. Um, sorry, my dog. Um, the second, the, the fourth thing is um, that we are not including them environmental costs into our prices. So companies are not paying for the cost of the resource use. Um, we are not, we as consumers are not paying for the harmful environmental costs of certain items. And then a lot of companies like oil and gas companies receive tax breaks and subsidies from the government in order to make their prices lower so that we will pay for more of those things. Um, last but not least, Humans um, are more and more isolated from nature because we are moving more to urban areas or suburban areas. And we've coined this nature deficit disorder. So we're not having enough contact with nature, which leads to um, not having the appreciation for nature in order to prevent environmental degradation. And all of this is going to stem back to our human population growth. So right here, you see we have our population growth um, this is something that's called a J-shaped curve. When you see a J-shaped curve, it's based on exponential growth or population at a fixed rate percent per unit time. Um, at some point in the future, maybe, we will um, reach something called our carrying capacity or the number of populations or people um, that the Earth can sustain. But no one really knows the number of humans the Earth can support right now. Um, especially when we can artificially raise our carrying capacity through um, these different revolutions that we've had. So these ways we have um, artificially raised our carrying capacity and we have this exponential growth still. Most of our environmental problems that we saw on the last slide do relate back to our human population. So if we think about how to solve these problems, we're going to talk about something called environmental ethics. We have three different worldviews in order to solve these problems. Um, and these think about what is wrong, right and wrong with how we treat the environment. So first of all, we have the planetary management worldview. And what this uh, really talks about is that humans are the most important species and we should manage our resources for our own benefit. Um, this is something called an anthropocentric viewpoint. So anthro meaning humans, centric meaning revolving around humans um, viewpoint um, that's human or uh, planetary management worldview the second is stewardship worldview so humans should be caring and responsible managers and should encourage environmental and economic practices that will not degrade the environment because we are stewards of the earth and we're um we have a ethical responsibility or a moral responsibility to be stewards and then third is an environmental wisdom worldview. So we are dependent on the earth and the natural capital it provides. So to be successful, so for the human um, species to be success successful, we must be a part of nature and manage resource use for all species. Um, social scientists do believe that this overall sustainable future is possible because it only takes five to 10% of the population to bring about a major social, social change. So if you think about who is in the most affluent, affluent countries, that's 17% of the entire population. And if we get all of those people on board, we could bring about a major change. 
Um, what that will entail is that we rely more on solar energy, we protect biodiversity, and we avoid disruption of the natural cycles. So what sustainability wants to do is meet our culture's current needs without compromising future generations' ability to meet their needs. And I'm going to leave you with this quote, and I'm going to go because my dog's barking, but you can read it, and goodbye.